So now, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the second speaker for uh, today. Um, and it is from uh, Splunk, uh, Gleb Eastman. Thank you, Bing. Hi, good morning. All right. Just give it another 30 seconds. Alex, you come closer. Cool. So solving crimes with wireless geofencing and multi-zone correlation analytics. Um, this actually, uh, my talk is a result of a real work I've done helping Alex, I'll introduce him briefly a bit later, uh, for one of the European law enforcement uh, agency, uh, where they were using interesting hardware that Alex built, and uh, I helped him from the software side. But let's do things in order. Uh, so I'm, I work at Splunk, so we have to show you guys this slide. Don't trust anything I tell you today, and don't trade any securities based on information I will tell you today. Special thanks to Alftel Systems. Alftel Alex Zaharov is the president of Alftel, and he's um, he's designer, he's super smart security guy, and he's designer of all these uh, cool devices. It's a, a multi, what's, what you see on your screen is a, a multi-channel Wi-Fi capture devices. Uh, basically, if you want to capture everything that's going on in Las Vegas, uh, you need like a few dozens of these things uh, spread around, and uh, you know, um, lots of in good information could be received by that stuff. So, and Alex, uh, I believe you're in a wireless packet village, right? Yeah. Uh, Scott Haskell, uh, he's a Splunker, exceptionally uh, good engineer, and he built the uh, Maps Plus app for Splunk. Uh, basically, that's a foundation of the uh, systems that I built, but and whatever I built for the last like six months, well, a little bit less, like four months, I will give it for free today. I'll send you a link, uh, and you'll be able to download and, and see how it works with some Maybe rough edges around the corners, but like it should work. Uh, so briefly about myself, uh, kind of first half of my career I worked at uh, malware analysis, antivirus software. Um, I moved from uh, uh, I moved in the United States for four years ago when I joined Splunk. I moved from Canada, so you guys can still see, uh, notice my Canadian accent. Yeah. <laughs> No? All right. Uh, I was born in Belarus. Um, so I was born in Belarus, and when I started working, uh, that's when the uh, era of computer viruses came in, and nobody knew what to do with them. So I was very curious and see what, what could be done. So all this like year of boot viruses, boot sector viruses, disk partition tables, and cool stuff. Uh, so um, yeah, lots of interesting work in that space. I worked for IBM Watson Research for six years uh, doing the same stuff. Uh, then I kind of deviate to e-commerce payment processing, digital information management solution, uh, data analytics. Um, uh, before Splunk, I worked at Morgan Stanley, uh, where uh, I dealt with uh, multiple <coughs> enterprise-wide uh, analytical systems. And uh, that's when I found about Splunk. And, um, uh, Splunk allowed me to do things much easier than any other tool, and I, like literally, uh, I get excited about it, and uh, that's how I evolved into joining Splunk later on. So, agenda for today, um, uh, definitions, uh, just to kind of set a baselines, uh, use cases for wireless geofencing, data pieces, it's a big part of this uh, presentation, sources, devices, where it's coming from, how to capture it, uh, what kind of conversion needs to be done to data, how to ingest it, um, creating Splunk application step by step, um, data visualization, maps plus, uh, solving use cases, and completed app demo. Uh, I uh, obviously will not be able to cover everything how to build Splunk apps, but I I present pretty good steps to for everybody uh, of you can start today, uh, and I think you will uh, you'll enjoy it um, if you uh, haven't 
uh, haven't seen Splunk before. So a couple definitions, uh, wireless forensics, and I, when I try to kind of come up with definitions, I uh, try to come up with a simple, uh, simplest possible definition for things. Wireless forensics, process of collecting and analyzing data from wireless devices. Uh, geofencing and the process of defining geographical boundaries or zones for whatever purpose. It could be multiple purposes, but uh, that's what geofencing essentially is. Um, Splunk, how many of you, could you raise your hands who don't know what Splunk is? Okay, cool. Um, I would say like 10%. Um, so Splunk is a software, it's a data analytics software platform uh, for uh, to get insights from the data. Uh, when I worked at Morgan Stanley before Splunk, like we, we got so many data sources coming in many different formats, and I was surprised that I can just throw it all to Splunk without any ETL, without any pre-processing, and Splunk would ingest and understand and immediately or almost immediately will let me search through this data and uh, correlate, combine, uh, come up with the dashboards and visualizations of the data. Uh, Splunk ingest any kind of data imaginable. Uh, it should be in textual format, not binary. Uh, if, if you have like binary data, so metadata could be extracted and ingested. But otherwise, uh, CSV, pipe delimited, any kind of uh, log files, obviously, uh, could be ingested by Splunk. Splunk is a very scalable solution. Um, and what, what I love about Splunk is that you can you can download absolutely a free version of Splunk. Uh, it's a fully featured enterprise version. Just go to Splunk website, download it. Um, it's a fully featured un, uh, enterprise version. Uh, Splunk charges for data in just per day. I just want to be upfront with like cost or free and things like that. Uh, if you ingest less, less than 500 megabytes per day, it's free forever. All of this full, fully featured enterprise tool is free. Uh, if, you if you register for developer account, which is anybody could do, uh, you get uh, ability to ingest f up to 50 gigabytes per day. I, I think I'm, uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm right about this number. 50 gig a day per f for free forever if you're a developer. And you can do lots of uh, things with this tool. Uh, Splunk is super open platform. Uh, everything is open, uh, there is APIs, SDKs, uh, uh, gigantic documentation all available online. You can install Splunk on the shittiest laptop you can come up with, it will work there. Uh, or uh, Mac, Windows, uh, Linux, uh, you can install Splunk in a thousand nodes uh, cloud deployment to scale up. We have customers who ingest more than like five plus petabytes of data per day into Splunk instances and uh, it works uh, just beautifully fine. So it's, it's, it's a cool system. When I first time saw it, I got hooked into that. I literally spent weekend uh, building stuff on it. Uh, okay, I uh, just want to be aware of time because there's lots of materials to cover. So suspects, crime, and Wi-Fi signals. So imagine a couple scenarios. Um, uh, crime one, arson happens at location A at time one, and a similar arson happens at location B at time two. Uh, kidnapping, location X, time three. A uh, similar crime at, at, at another location at, at another time. Robbery at, at location and the kind of similar patterns happen in uh, different places at different times. So the questions, so we want to build a system that would help us to solve crimes. Uh, who did it? Uh, what, who are the possible suspects? Give us full list of suspects. Who is the most probable suspect? Well, we want to sort at least, like show us the top you know, five, ten people or like uh, metadata that uh, would possibly lead us to actual suspects. Um, so we want to build solutions that uh, first uh, sort Wi-Fi signals by the probability of being suspect, uh, taking GPS coordinates, time and signal strengths into account to calculate this probability. Uh, while building this solution, working with Alex, uh, uh, we came up with a formula that actually uh, helps to do just that. Uh, basically calculate a risk score uh, that would uh, sort uh, metadata by the most probably uh, belonging to to suspect, uh, and uh, well, this form all will be on one of the slides. And second, visually define multiple geofence zones. Uh, so essentially, you will have a map. You can you'll be able to build solution, have a map, 
uh, all your devices, all your captured uh, data sources will be on this map. You'll be able to visually define uh, zones of interest. You, you will be able to define times for each zone and then correlate them together to find uh, answers. So by monitoring Wi-Fi spectrum for signals emitted by wireless devices, we can match crime scenes and times uh, to wireless devices owned by possible suspects. So uh, let me shift and skip the next slide. So last year, uh, there were a series of uh, uh, pipe bomb explosions, uh, like a real case. Uh, police was investigated that, uh, and uh, uh, typically they um, uh, issue warrant to, uh, uh, to Google. Uh, because they know that, well, if, if, if the same person does that, maybe that person had an uh, Android device phone in, in his pocket, and um, uh, Google would know everything, because Android devices, uh, any phone device would just do call home, ping uh, home, and with that data, uh, somewhere GPS coordinates of this device being sent, and uh, by correlating these areas, and times of crime together, it's possible to uh, uh, to pinpoint uh, to possible suspect in this. So that's called geofence warrants. Uh, it's how law enforcement uh, uh, come to Google and ask them to help. And Google using something similar. I don't know what exactly what, how system look like, but what we're going to build today is looking something pretty similar uh, to that. So essentially. Uh, zone is defined, time is defined, and then multiple zone is defined, and then, okay, show us all devices that are possibly present in, uh, uh, in all of these zones. And then we uh, might get in closer to the criminal who did that. Um, so how to capture data? Um, now, I'm not going to focus too much today about actual packet uh, disassembling, but uh, uh, basically, what, what we do after the fact. But to capture the data, on the left side is a kind of poor man solution. Uh, you can get these cheap things, uh, plug into your laptop, or you, you don't even have to do that. Your laptop Wi-Fi card can uh, capture the signal. You install Wireshark, and it will switch your network interface to promiscuous mode, and basically you start capturing Wi-Fi data from around you. So um, that's uh, what I call poor man solution. Like real man solution on the right side, it's uh, Alex's Alftel devices that uh, could capture simultaneously multiple channels. So if you don't want to miss anything, if it's a serious project, uh, you want to have device that will provide you, give you lot, lots more capabilities. So Alex devices is, uh, did you bring any things with you in your, in your pocket? Yeah. So Alex's device is basically a Linux box uh, with connected to this multi-channel things that looks like a spider. Uh, this is how I call my app Spider 2. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's like multiple antennas capture multiple channels simultaneously. Pretty cool stuff. It runs Linux, uh, and you can do anything with this device. It has LTE interface. You can remotely control this device through the, uh, your cell phone if you want to. Uh, from any country in the world. You can see what it's captured. You can send a uh, program device to send captured data anywhere uh, and anywhere you like, for example, in your Splunk instance, and uh, it will uh, show the stuff. So um, apps or application. Uh, Splunk um, has app store called uh, Splunk Base. Actually, it's a wrong store. It's a wrong word store. It's not store. Uh, Splunkbase.com, it's a repository of Splunk applications. Uh, 90 5% of them are free. Uh, sort of like uh, you download this app, uh, apply it to Splunk, and it will give you some extra capabilities or uh, extra visualizations. So it's pretty cool. Uh, uh, you should check it out. Uh, there's lots of um, interesting applications that you can just uh, download to Splunk, apply it, it, it will work, and it looks cool. Um, create new app. Um, so it's very easy. Uh, you go to Splunk. Uh, you log into Splunk Web. So by the way, when you install Splunk, uh, it will everything you can manage through the web interface. 
uh, if you're a developer, anything in Splunk you can manage through REST API calls. Uh, like I mean, literally, you don't need to use any UI. It's all REST API-able system. Uh, everything could be controlled. But uh, visually, you can uh, just follow the steps. I will not do them of these steps, but uh, uh, just click create new app, uh, and uh, like in, in 30 seconds, you'll have your own blank new app. Uh, you create index, uh, which is a database you, you, will, you will ingest data to, and then capture data, uh, pick up files. If you use Wireshark, uh, that's the quickest way to start capturing data. You can download samples from the web, but I think it's pretty interesting if you just do it yourself. Um, capture data and pick up files. Uh, convert data to CSV format. So pick up is a binary. Uh, we need to convert them to text, and we also need to specify which fields we are interested in to this data. Uh, that would be, for example, MAC addresses. Uh, that would be uh, information, uh, some uh, information related to um, uh, beaconing and uh, some uh, capabilities of uh, uh, wireless source uh, would be there in this, in this data. It, it could be gigantic. It could be as small as you like. Uh, and just data to Splunk, again, it's it's pretty uh, simple thing to do. Uh, there is a menu. Uh, actually, let me just let me just show you. Uh, so to just this is Splunk uh, instance. It's kind of small. Let me just make it bigger. So you could uh, to ingest data, you go to uh, like settings, add data, and then it will let you. No, this is like this is demo machine. Uh, it's actually in my home uh, in San Francisco, and uh, I kind of hope it works nice. <laughs> fine today for the demos. But you can adjust data in so multiple ways. But simplest way: settings, add data, upload, and and you'll be done with that. So it's pretty um, straightforward. Okay, let me just go back. Okay. Um, ingest data, build analytical layer logic, dashboards, SPL queries. So that's um, that's what we'll be talking more about. Um, oh, so, so create a new Splunk app. I just uh, specify the steps, exact step, exact things you should click on. Uh, you know, on your menus after you install Splunk to uh, uh, to make it happen. Uh, pretty simple, all visual. Uh, there is like literally, uh, there is very little. Uh, Zero coding to do to build the solution. You might adjust SPL queries a little bit, but uh, uh, there is uh, not uh, uh, not much of a, uh, actual. You don't need to be a coder to do it. Uh, capture data, converting data to CSV format. Uh, so what I used, uh, we have um, we worked on data files. Uh, we I used the T Shark utility to convert them to um, uh, CSV format. Uh, actually, to pipe the limited format, and so that's a command line. It's kind of gigantic looking, but uh, essentially why it's so big because I uh, wanted to extract as many fields that I I wanted I wanted to, and it's like dash e field name dash e field name. That's why it's kind of so big. Um, let me see what's on the next slide. So that's the result of converted data. How it looks like. Uh, so essentially, uh, let me just. Uh, so that that's how it looks like. Uh, so we have like gigantic header. And uh, that's how yeah, I'm just trying to, yeah, OK. I uh, wanted to kind of make it on one line. But um, so uh, after you run, it's pretty fast utility, uh, very quick uh, conversion to CSV file. And at this point, this, this kind of file you can ingest to Splunk directly now. And that's what you will do following this guide. Um, Splunk source type, uh, every data source you come send to Splunk, you can specify a little bit about how this file looks like, what, what, which field, if some field needs a little bit of uh, tweaking, you can specify them on this file uh, with some, sim some instructions. Uh, I gave you, you will get it already pre, um, uh, uh, pre uh, not pre-installed, but like within the zip files that I'll give you to download. It will be there. You can look at that, read Splunk docs, what they mean. But essentially, this configuration file means we have delimiter is a pipe. A line breaker is carriage return line feed, and it's CSV. Uh, there is, and then I create some aliases, uh, WS call protocol uh, as protocol. So kind of create aliases for fields to make it easier than to do search and build dashboards after that. Um, so um, adding data to Splunk, um, after you uh, 
if you manually update the source type prop files that I uh, specified in this previous slide, uh, you, you run this command, change ownership, make sure everything in your app owned by Splunk Splunk, and that's a, basically what this, uh, what this tells about. Adding data to index, again, set of instruction, how to, what, what you need to click to upload data to Splunk. So literally, having that couple slides, you'll be able to um, uh, proceed this, uh, follow this whole process. So after you ingest data to Splunk, you'll end up with, um, um, uh, with a kind of bare index uh, that I want to show you how it works. So uh, I go to app, let's say you will create this app. You'll go to this app to search, and then you can do some ad hoc searching here. So what I do here, as I said, okay, this is in my name of my index. Give me a most recent 100 results, and uh, to show me table of results for this field that I'm interested in. Timestamp, fra frame number, latitude, longitude, and some information about the data that's within the file. So I run this query, Splunk return my results. I can see all of them, and uh, I can scroll. But remember this gigantic, uh, um, gigantic uh, CSV files, there's like way more data here. So what I can specify is that, okay, well, you know, so Splunk, show me everything you've got in my fields. So I can say, okay, table, WLAN star, and I can rerun the security, and now I get this table, but it's much wider. So pretty much every field here uh, we can see. Uh, scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll. Uh, pretty cool stuff here, like capabilities, frequencies, um, signal strengths, uh, uh, vendor name for MAC address, and all this good goodness here. Uh, you, you notice here the beacon frames uh, and probe responses. So probes actually contains more interesting data that allows to identify, kind of follow the, um, uh, follow the source. And you can say, okay, Splunk, show me only uh, packets that contain these probes. So I can just type probe here, index probe, and then now I can see only probes for each MAC addresses that whatever they sent to the, uh, whatever they broadcasted. And uh, this kind of helps to identify data source. Okay. Um, summary index. Um, summary index is a, a technique where you, uh, when you have ingest raw data, but you actually do search on a subset of fields, it's cleaner to create secondary summary index uh, that only contains the fields that you are interested in and that uh, the fields that you are going to search more often on. Uh, so summary index will kind of, uh, when you create it, it will. Um, uh, requires some storage space, but it doesn't apply toward your license. It's uh, kind of, from Slong perspective, it's um, it's free for you. You can use it, or if it helps. Uh, so I I present a couple samples of queries. Uh, what's kind of why we create summary index? So in some cases, um, sender names. That's the field I create. Uh, that uh, is a combination of uh, WNSA resolved. It's a source address. WATA resolved uh, source uh, or source. Uh, source like find me first fields out of these three that non-null and consider it as a sender name. Uh, and so a couple things like that, I, sorry, uh, uh, that a couple queries like that would help me to um, extract fields, put them in summary index, and then I would use that summary index to do all my dashboards and queries and all my analytics based on. Um, that's how we create summary index. It's a sample of SPL that you run once. Um, if you want to do it ad hoc manually, if you want to build the system to function automatically, you can create schedule search and say to run every five minutes because data is consist uh, continuously coming in. Uh, and um, the link that I'll provide you to download this app also will have a readme file with a sample of this query that you can just copy paste and run it uh, on your app when you create it. Um, data model, uh, I just mentioned it. Uh, accelerated data models is a way how you can uh, structure your data within Splunk to uh, query 100 to 1,000 times faster. Uh, it's basically create index fields of, for every field of interest. And uh, uh, if you have, let's say, hundreds of millions of events, you want to search through all of them in like uh, in, in uh, seconds, not in hours, accelerated data model is the way to go. 
so uh, Splunk 90-10 rule. So you know 80-20 rule, uh, you can do 20% of effort to accomplish 80% of results. So in Splunk world it's like you can do 10% of effort to accomplish 90% of results. So 90% uh, of all dashboard logic code and all the kind of analytical layer is, uh, c could be contained in XML. When you create an app, you create, uh, essentially you create XML files with some text uh, configuration files. Uh, you can drive it completely through web, web UI. You don't need to do any coding. Uh, you can customize stuff with CSS and JavaScript, of course, but uh, it's very visual. Um, 90% uh, of all dashboards uh, could be built as following. So basically you go to uh, uh, Splunk uh, ad hoc search. Uh, you run some uh, query. Let's say I want to create query that shows me the fields of interest. And now I want to create a dashboard. So you can essentially save as dashboard panel. And that's how dashboard gets created in Splunk. Uh, so, like 90% of how people build dashboards, that actually start with this ad hoc, save as a dashboard or panel, and then you start building this visual represent, uh, visual interface. Um, so this is, that's essentially uh, what I what I mentioned specified here. Uh, when you um, run Query, let me just um, actually as a little bit demo for that right after that. So. Um, Uh, when you run Query in Splunk, uh, uh, by default it uh, returns you a table, but you can also select visualization. Like say, say to Splunk, I actually want to visualize this result in some interesting way. And I'm about to do a demo for you uh, how it works. So, um, um, so this is a Query that um, uh, go and search our summary index that we created. And I'm only interested in three fields. I'm interested in latitude, longitude, and uh, a description, which is um, access point names. So I want to visualize from the, my pickup file uh, on a map uh, where these access points are. And uh, so I run this query first, make sure it returns me latitude, longitude, and uh, access point name. Now I click on visualization section, and here I can select what, how I want to visualize this data. Now, bubble chart, this type of visualization selected here, doesn't make much sense for that type of data. So I click on uh, this uh, icon, and Splunk shows you all visualizations that are available to you uh, to visualize data set. So, um, Let me just find the Maps Plus app. So Maps Plus, I added it to Splunk already. So I click on it, and uh, basically that's what's happened. So instead of um, uh, instead of like bubble chart or whatever, I just said, okay, use Maps visualization for the data set. Each visualization requires certain data fields to be present, and Maps Plus is really happy that I have latitude, longitude, and description. And now I can actually zoom in into these uh, data points. And uh, I can see exactly where they were captured. So that's basically um, law enforcement vehicle with Alex's device installed was uh, driving around and collecting data. Now the data I shown here is anonymized, uh, but uh, essence is the same. So that, that's how it works. And then you can zoom in further and see, uh, you know, see device uh, identifications. Any metadata that is present in uh, uh, pickup files would be shown here. So that that's how it works. Uh, about the Map Plus app, uh, you can click on Format, and there is like literally uh, hundreds and hundreds of options you can you can change. You can say, okay, well, I don't want Open Street Map. I want some sort of like a dark uh, representation of map. So now we have like this, you know cool dark app uh, that is, you know, shown essentially the same thing. Um, you can um, uh, go to format, you can select uh, uh, clusters, you can select markers, heat maps, uh, and I'll show you heat maps um, pretty soon. Uh, you can uh, decide to apply uh, Bing maps with your uh, API keys. Uh, you can decide to represent data as Google places around these captured points, for example. Uh, you can pick and choose custom colors for every little bit and piece of that you want to put on this map. So it's pretty flexible uh, capabilities uh, that you want to, uh, that would be uh, pretty interesting to employ here. 
I actually think I uh, run a little bit forward, so that's that's a demo I just show you uh, about all the how this map looks like. Uh, pretty simple again, t fully visually in like uh, two minutes you can run Qt, save it as a dashboard uh, with a map there, and kind of start building from there. Um, that's uh, one kind of one of the demo snapshot of what this map is capable of. Uh, so uh, Scott Haskell decided to as a demo visualize all the. Um, criminal activity in Chicago. So you know, when he downloads this criminal activity CSV from a uh, uh, police website, you know, this map looks like, oh my God, like there's like lots of going on here. And you can filter on different crimes and, uh, you know, do lots of sorting here. Pretty interesting stuff. But you can represent each dot. You can, let's say, okay, this type of crime is red dot. This type of crime is like big purple dot. Uh, so it's fully customizable here. Um, so um, when I did work with Alex, uh, we've been provided with a number of data sources, data files, uh, which were captured by uh, two different uh, devices, basically, or two different vehicles. And um, we, one of the ask was uh, how we can, is it possible to add a heat map on a map uh, that would represent the strengths of the um, signal source. And uh, when you capture the data with Wireshark or with uh, um, Alex devices, uh, typically this um, signal strength will be uh, present there. And so based on this field value, uh, we came up with uh, SPL. SPL is a Splunk processing language. So that's uh, basically query that uh, we calculate heat map on a three, many three zones, uh, like weak, uh, medium, and strong. And uh, uh, then we uh, basically create a, run a table, latitude, longitude, and heat map. And from this point on, uh, that map that I show you suddenly will will uh, will show uh, will will show a heat map like this. And that would be, I believe, um, this demo. So that's how heat map looks like of the same data, same data set, but uh, uh, heat, map, heat map functions added to the query. And now you can zoom uh, further. Uh, each heat map is presented by the separate layer. I can say, okay, just show me the strongest uh, signal sources here. So I can uh, filter out weaker layers and uh, just see what the strongest signals looks like on this map, where exactly they were located and uh, uh, how they were called. Uh, things like that. So it's pretty uh, pretty interesting capabilities. Um, and then I can also choose to, okay, just don't show me points, just show me heat map. I want to see uh, how uh, covered this area by, uh, uh, by the signal, so I can do things like that as well. Um, let me just make sure I'm jumping too far ahead. So, um, I want to show you this. It's kind of high resolution, like I worked on this map for this like 4K screen. Uh, I'm trying to squeeze it here. Uh, basically, these panels, it's a simple search uh, running against this pickup capture data that shows um, uh, senders, receivers, access points, and protocols that were engaged in this, uh, uh, in this data. And I can now can do lots of filterings. For example, I can see, okay, show me uh, only this data, only this sender MAC address. So I can click on map, uh, map address, uh, on MAC address. Um, Splunk will recalculate all statistics based on only for that data source, and it will show me on a map uh, this data source, and it will show me all statistics that is uh, related to this, whom this uh, source was talking to, what kind of protocols were used, uh, what, uh, protocols, what kind of access point were involved into these conversations, and things like that. So I can uh, also see, like this chart on the right shows me uh, multiple set of data, like protocols or access points. So I can choose to expand time chart, and uh, it now this time chart kind of uh, looks more user friendlier. And uh, it's interesting to see spike on this chart. I can zoom in into the spike and see all the 
uh, access point or data sources that were responsible for this uh, uh, spike in conversations. I can see MAC addresses. I can sort data by the vendor of MAC address. I see the Cisco devices. 18 MAC addresses were captured that were responsible for most of that traffic within this time frame. I can choose to represent data instead of uh, protocols or, uh, for example, on this chart, uh, I see um, I see access points, but I want to see protocols, so I can uh, dr drill down, um, uh, so I can drop down protocols, and uh, Splunk will recalculate everything and show me the protocols. So 82.11 is uh, probably the most present data source. Now we have some DNS frames, uh, we have other protocols, and I can again zoom in and see who was responsible most for like DNS queries or or some interesting things that I might be able to find it. And uh, data in, in the map will automatically uh, will be redrawn and show me uh, only uh, sources that I'm interested in. Um, all the queries uh, will be, so you'll get the copy of this map and see, of this app, and see exactly how it's implemented. Um, basically, to design this dashboard, uh, you can just click edit and start adding controls to the, uh, to the uh, let me just do it. So click edit, and then I could, let's say, add panel, or add input, and input, input would be one of these, like text, radio button, drop down, checkbox, and so I added a couple of this, uh, textual inputs that will allow me to do filtering on, the, on this data. Uh, and so when I click on one of these names or MAC addresses, I automatically populate one of these inputs and search query is, pick, picks this up and uh, recalculates everything. So it's pretty flexible systems that you can uh, build and design totally visually without coding. Uh, correlating data from multiple captured devices. Uh, so uh, I want to um, cover this suspect score, how we calculate po possible suspect score. So imagine we have a fixed uh, capture point, capture devices like that, uh, where uh, they installed into the areas, maybe more uh, areas of interest where you know crime usually happens or uh, some security um, areas that uh, needs to be monitored and uh, we need to investigate uh, events as it happens in multiple places and each device has some captured data for us so um, what we want to find is devices that were present at that times in these two locations uh, which is pretty easy to do. We can just do a stats, uh, that's a sample of query, uh, stats by uh, sender MAC, uh, and show us DCSRC means, uh, calculate us number of distinct uh, uh, data sources for each MAC address. So if this MAC was present in two places, this DCSRC will be, uh, this places variable will be equal to two. So show me place where, for all MAC addresses where places more than one. But now this will give us a list of um, uh, all devices that were present in both locations, but it doesn't calculate any score. They kind of like equal at this point. So we want to actually uh, calculate, come up with a way to calculate the score for each device uh, to uh, consider that some of them are more probable suspect and some are less. So in this case, we consider uh, signal strengths, uh, which we have available. Uh, so we have uh, signal strength, time, and location. Uh, in this case, uh, that's how we calculate score. So we basically um, uh, consider single strengths in, um, we divide it by 20. So we come up with a five level of signal strengths um, and uh, it becomes a DBM score at this point. Oops, just DBM score. Um, so the total score of each uh, MAC address uh, will be sum of scores for at each location multiplied by the um, uh, number of places, square root of m number of places. So to explain it in kind of human terms, uh, what we're looking for, uh, if we have uh, one strong signal in one location and we have another, uh, another s signal which was, was very weak but in both location, we want this weak uh, signal source to have higher scores than this strong signal score because the strong one was only at one location. So that formula takes care of that. And uh, the result of that calculation, uh, I'll show on this on uh, one of the next dashboards. Uh, so this, 
uh, table in the middle. That's actually what it does. So it uh, in this app, I have two data sources available, S1 and S2. And uh, the task is solving is find me all MAC addresses that were present in both location and sort them by the highest score on top. And so that's the result of it. And then I can see uh, some identifi identity of the signal sources that uh, were captured and contains the highest score. So that's essentially this formula applied and this dashboard as a result of it. Now, and to uh, jump into actual geofencing here, uh, the map, uh, map plus app has capabilities to visually uh, define geofence zones. And uh, each zone is represented once you define it, and I'll show you how, uh, is represented by the series of uh, latitude, uh, comma, longitude, semicolon. So if you define a zone in like six dots, it will have this, uh, it will come up with a string of all these uh, GPS coordinates uh, together, and you can copy and paste the string or look at it and do whatever you, you, you want with it. Um, and Splunk will, so the task that this dashboard will, so, will show that I'll show you next, uh, it will calculate the presence of uh, every access point on every GFN zone defined. So that's, that's how it looks like uh, as a result. And I want to show you uh, the demo now, demo four. And that's actual uh, dashboard. Just uh, make it zoom out a little bit. So um, we have uh, maps here. Uh, that's the data represented on a map. No zones defined yet. Uh, I made it so we can define four separate zones here, zone one, zone two, up to zone four. And for each zone, we can define specific time frame. So if I'm interested in, if I know that a uh, certain number of events happened, and I know timing of this event, and I know location of this event, now I want to find which data sources, which signal sources were present in all of these locations. So what I can do here, for example, let's define the zone right 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 here. So I click on this start new measurement and I start plotting the points just clicking here and then double click on my last point and here I have the zone defined. So feature definitions that's a long string that actually lists all GPS coordinates that are part of this zone and I copy and paste it into zone one boundary. So when I do that, Splunk actually calculates the bounding rectangle across uh, around this polygon and uh, gives me the result. Okay, so we got this bounding rectangle for your zone is here. So what next? So next I want to define two more zones. So I go back, create new measurement. So for example, I know something happened in this area. So I want to define zone around that area. I want to take feature definition, which is a uh, information about the zone, paste it, tab, Splunk recalculate, redraw everything after each, do, each zone is defined. So now I have second zone. Now I want to have, I want to define third zone. So new measurement. Each zone is colored differently for simplicity, uh, for to visually uh, understand it better. So I copy a zone definition from the third zone, paste it into zone three boundary here. And uh, now I got three zones defined. I also can define specific time frame for each zone. I don't want to do it right now. It's, it's, uh, it gets a bit uh, kind of, uh, it will take too much time. But it's easy to do in Splunk. You can just click on this time and is it defined relative or real time or date range or date and time range uh, in so many ways. So it's possible to do. Now, uh, I want to find the data that we show in this table uh, on the left is the matching signal sources across all defined constraints. So right now I have lots of results here, and why? Because uh, matching rule, uh, this drop down says show all, uh, show everything, ignore zones. So basically show all data that I have. But now I can actually uh, apply any rule I want here. So for example, I can tell Splunk, okay, show me the point. I have three zones defined, but I'm interested in points that will present in at least two zones. So I can just click here, and Splunk will recalculate all this, uh, uh, all this data for me. And so now instead of a uh, few hundreds points, I get only four. So only four points, but these four were present in at least two uh, zones out of three. 
So this point on wire zero two was present in zone number two and number three. Uh, unity media was present in zone number one and number three and so on. Uh, if I want to find all points that uh, were present in all defined zones, I can just um, select this one, present in all defined zones. Splunk will recalculate me and find, give me an answer, which would be probably uh, just one point. So on, now I have only one signal source that was defined in all these three zones at all the specified, uh, at the specified times. Uh, and uh, now I can visually uh, tap into all the data I have and uh, uh, pretty quickly get answers to uh, the kind of questions uh, that would allow me to correlate data sources between uh, uh, different times and geographical coordinates. Live demos, was that what we just did? And I finished a bit early. Uh, so uh, geofencing, so xp.us slash geofencing, uh, that's, a, that's where you can go and um, download this app and download the readme files that uh, shows you step-by-step -step instructions how to install it. Um, I might be missing something, so please feel free to add me, uh, to send me a mail or uh, add me on LinkedIn. Um, ask me any questions, so I'll be happy to help. Um, and I'll probably will update some of this um, readme files or maybe up later on. Uh, but um, yeah, um, so that's, that's what I want to cover and to introduce you to uh, this technology, what it can do for you and how you can play with it. Um, so back to my times at where I was uh, uh, before Splunk. Uh, uh, my boss told me like, I, I was hired actually to deploy one of the IBM, um, uh, IBM analytical systems. Uh, into bank environment, and so uh, I was working on fraud and security teams, and they keep coming to me and like asking questions, like help us to investigate crime, uh, help us to investigate this f uh, suspicious fraudulent or anomalous activity on our user accounts, and so I, what I had to do, I had to extract data from the IBM system and ingest it into Splunk to actually find an answer in this question. So my my boss told me like. Well, you were hired to do work on the IBM system, not on the Splunk. And so I actually had to do spend the weekends to do uh, work with Splunk to actually come up with the answers. And like security, I, I really love working on security data sets and uh, uh, find suspicious activities there. Um, so anyway, eventually I just joined Splunk and uh, I'm super happy now. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, please, uh, any questions? Thank you. Say it again. Did you have to deal with mass randomization on the phone at all? Um, so, yes and no. So for this specific app, uh, it was like POC, and uh, uh, this is a concern to find, to, to really, um, uh, to really kind of, uh, Put identity to to the device because MAC addresses could change. I think the probe packets would would help to identify device or provide some context uh, for the device, even if it changed MAC. I'm not an expert in that, though. I would probably uh, ask somebody who knows how to identify devices that has random MACs. But I don't know, Alex. Uh, uh, is it is it a, like what's today? Is it concern or like how the I found the device capabilities. There is some data points that shows, for example, uh, WLAN supported rates, frequency. Uh, there is some device capabilities that also helps to um, kind of put some metadata on the device, even though, even though it would change Mac. Uh, but yeah, I guess there is multiple answers to this question. But somebody who is an expert probably will be able to dig deeper.
Well, I guess thanks. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, good to be here.